Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Sedicase. I've got a couple degrees in theology, and I'm working on another in philosophy of religion. And uh, man, I've had some amazing conversations throughout my studies with brilliant people. But unfortunately, most of those conversations have not been recorded. So the goal of this podcast is to have similar conversations, to record them, and then to share them with you so that you get to learn as I learn. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today's episode is going to be a really, really special one. As uh, you guys, my audience will know, I mostly deal with analytic theology, analytic philosophy, uh, Anglo-American style of philosophy. Today, we're going to be getting into some continental stuff. And, you know, we can debate whether there is a true continental analytic divide, all that good stuff. Maybe we might get into that. But I'm really excited for this episode because it's going to stretch me a ton. And uh, we're also going to be talking a little bit about Cornelius Van Til, uh, one of my favorite thinkers. And I have with me Dr. Chris Berwakin. We're going to be talking about his book, uh, Jacques Derrida, in the Great Thinker series. Uh, and that's with PNR, Presbyterian and Reform Publishing. So I'm really, really excited for that. Stick around. It's going to be great. Before we jump in, though, I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for making this show happen. You guys are awesome. Uh, if this is one of your favorite podcasts, one of your favorite shows, one of your favorite YouTube channels, please consider becoming a Patreon patron, a supporter of the show. You can find a link to my Patreon in the description. And when you go over there, you can find all sorts of stickers and mugs and T-shirts and all different stuff at different levels. Uh, whatever you can do to help would be awesome. If you want to keep this show going, please consider supporting the podcast. Another way you can support it is to leave me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And then if you're on YouTube, uh, go ahead and leave a comment and a like and share it, all that good stuff. You can also talk with a lot of my uh, without a lot of my guests in the Parker's Pensies Ponceurs uh, uh, Facebook group. I'm terrible at French. Dr. Watkin can help me with that uh, after this. Um, so that's that. those are really good ways to support me. Another way is to check out my sponsor, Biblios Clothing Company. If you look in the description, again, of this video or this audio, wherever you're getting this stuff at, you can find a link to Biblios Clothing Company. Uh, and that's my link. 10% uh, off your entire order if you go through my link. So check them out. They're awesome. Uh, it's a Christian clothing company. They got really, really cool designs. And uh, makes me look amazing when you click through my link and buy uh, with my link. So you get 10% off. I look, I get to look awesome. Please go and support them to support me. So without further ado, let's jump in. We're going to be talking about Jacques Derrida. And I think Derrida, um, I think most of you probably don't get them right because I know my audience. I know you guys. So I'm really excited to, to serve you guys in this way by unleashing Derrida for, for who he really is and then putting him in contact with Cornelius Van Til. So let's do it. Dr. Watkin, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's a real pleasure for me to be here today, Parker. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. So um, you are you're an associate professor at Monash. Is that Spot right? on. All at right. Monash <laughs> University. All right. Great, great. Uh, I, I do apologize because I'm sure that you hearing me say Parker's Pensies probably just is really irritating. But I'm an American swine and, uh, you know, I don't speak French. <laughs> Do you know what? You communicated effectively. That's what, that's, <laughs> that's what we're going to be talking about a lot today. That's great. Well, um, when I do have people on who can speak French, I usually like to ask them, w would you, if you don't mind, pronounce the, the proper name of the podcast? Um, I would say Parker's Pensée, but I, I also need to give you an anecdote. Have you got time for a quick anecdote? I do. Yes, please. Okay. So I'm, I'm a first year undergraduate uh, in a German translation class, and there's about 16 of us. And there's a very intimidating looking professor in front of us. And the, the way that it works is you go around the class and everybody sort of says aloud a sentence that you've translated. Uh, and I, I remember very, very vividly one moment where one sort of unlucky fellow classmate on the day uh, was translating a sentence from German into English. Uh, and uh, he said, uh, Berlin, giving it the German pronunciation in mm. English. And you should have seen the face. I remember his name, Professor Paulin. I only ever had him once, it was for this class. He sort of looked over his glasses in that Donnish way. That <laughs> and he said, uh, in German, it is Berlin. In English, it is Berlin. And so from, <laughs> from that point on, I've always said, let's, let's not try to pronounce foreign words with foreign accents in English. You know, we, we're good with Derrida. We're good with Ponce. Okay. We don't need to do Ponce or anything like that. Yeah, so <laughs> English, English accents are just fine. Okay. That's fantastic news. Oh, I'm so excited to hear that. Oh man. Well, okay. So, um, I want to get into, to, uh, to Jacques Derrida and, uh, 
there's a lot to cover. There's a lot of different terminology and stuff like that. But I thought before we get in, it might be interesting to hear, how did you even get interested in Derrida studies at all? Yeah, it's a really good question. I was trying to rack my brains and reconstruct what led me to it in, in preparation for this podcast. Look, I think I've always just been really interested in big questions. You know, what's the meaning of life? Why are we here? That sort of thing. And that's, I guess, partly what led me to Christianity, because Christians love those big questions. What is mm -hmm. the fundamental truth behind, you know, the stuff that we see? Mm -hmm. and, and philosophers do too. So I was always sort of primed to pick up on that sort of thing. Yeah. And then at university, there was a unit that, that we could choose called Modern Critical Theory. And it was supposed to be a fourth year unit, but I, I pleaded and begged to do it in my second year and was finally granted dispensation. And it was an absolute sweet shop experience, I'm telling mm. you. It was just wonderful. There was a week on Derrida, a week on Deleuze, a week on Foucault, and you know, a week on historicism. And, and just the, the sense that here were people, you know, not necessarily in ways that I agreed with, but were trying to come to terms with how we make sense of the world. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I got hooked. Uh, I really got into trying to, to think through with them. Where do I agree? Where, where do we part ways? What tools are they bringing to this sort of thing? And, and David was one of those guys. Um, and yeah, it just took off from there, really. Yeah. Well, and uh, you said this was an undergrad. Where was that at? That was at Cambridge. Okay. Did you do your, your um, I don't know, your, your doctoral work there too as well? Yeah, that's right. So okay. undergrad, MPhil, PhD, then a, a postdoc there and a, a little bit of lecturing. Oh, wow. And then in yeah. 2011, uh, Alison and I came over to Australia, to Melbourne, where we've been uh, since then. Okay. And and uh, so I don't believe you guys call it dissertation, but I think you call it thesis for your for your PhD. Is that right? Yeah, PhD thesis. That's right. Okay. Okay. And, and what was that on? <laughs> well... And this is gonna this is gonna have your your viewers and listeners in raptures. Um, it was the the question of ontology in the philosophy of Melo Ponti, uh, Paul Ricoeur, and Jean Luc Nancy. Uh, and I I like to hold on to the thought that both people who have read it really enjoyed it. <laughs> That's awesome. That sounds great. Well, so I I ask because um, I I don't know a ton about Cambridge and what what's going on there philosophically, but. You know, uh, it's in England, right? So, so you'd think it'd be Anglo-American analytic style of philosophy, and yet here you are uh, studying Derrida. And uh, how did that happen? Did you take? Um, were, were there like continental classes in analytic? Is it is it not divided like that over there? I'm I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. Yeah. So it was part of a modern and medieval languages degree. So mm -hmm. it wasn't in the philosophy department, but okay. it was with um, the, so the, the way that it works is that each college has its specialists. So there'll be a French person pretty much in each college. So there'll be okay. 20 odd French people and, and three or four of those are specialist philosophers. Mm -hmm. So they're the people who will teach the, the French philosophy part of the French degree. Okay. And I did uh, that unit uh, with, with some of those and there were some outside speakers who came in as well. So the, 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 the continental bastion, if you like, yeah. Uh, in, in Cambridge. And look, look that division is, is largely um, a thing of the past, okay. uh, I would venture, and yeah. then, then put my tin hat on while people come at me. Um, <laughs> right. but I, I, I think that that is, that is a thing of the past. So I, I think it's less acute than it was in the 1990s. Okay. Um, but certainly uh, at that time, if you wanted to do the continental stuff, it was pretty much through the French department that that was mainly done. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. So then um, you wrote this book in the uh, Great Thinkers uh, series with PNR. And I, I think that means that you need to be reformed to write that. Um, do, you, do you call yourself reformed? Are you cool with that title? Yeah, I'm happy with that title. I, I tend not to uh, be over keen to, to label myself. Sure. Um, but I'm, I also recognize that labels like that are very helpful. The, I mean, the problem always is, and you know, I'm not the first to say this, that people impute to you, you know, a whole truckload of ideas as soon as you use That's the right. label. And I, I prefer to to be able to articulate those myself. But yeah, reformed is, is good. Yeah. Okay. And so um, in this book, I think we'll, we'll get to it in a little bit, but um, you put Derrida, Derrida in, uh, in contact with Van Til. And I really like that. Um, and I haven't seen a whole lot of that. So I'll just... 
an, a further question, you know, how how'd you get into Van Til studies? How'd you how'd you learn about Van Til? This is a really lovely story, and I look back on this with a lot of affection, both for for the work that people were doing in Cambridge at the time, and also God's grace. Mm. So there's a wonderful old church in the middle of Cambridge called the Round Church, a sort of 10th century Norman church, beautiful place. And there's a, a group of, of scholars based there called Christian Heritage. And they, they run tours of Cambridge, and they also have a library. And they, they invited undergrads in, Christian undergrads, to, to come and have a look, borrow some books. And I think I first stumbled across Doiver there, Oh, and wow. his roots of Western culture. Mm. Uh, we didn't know anything about him, didn't know anything about the context, picked it up, picked it up, read it. Again, just fantastic, you know, attempt to try and make sense of how we've got where we've got. Um, and there was some Ruckmacher in there, Schaefer, of course, the Schaefer trilogy, I remember devouring. Yeah. And I think it was there that I first came across the name Van Til. But, you know, I don't think, and like, I may be wrong about this, I don't think they had any Van Til in the library. So I ended up Googling him. Okay. Um, in the in the college sort of computer room, and um, you know, pulling up as much as I could, and just getting really interested in the way again that he was trying to make sense of how the modern world makes sense. Yeah. And um, and I think it was only when I I bought the Logos package uh, of all of Van Til's works and started um, munching my way through those that I mm -hmm. really began to get to grips with him. That was a few years later. Yeah. So it was a gradual process of yeah. being exposed and intrigued and then finally taking the plunge. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, um, so before we get there, uh, you have this great point in in your book that uh, we need to earn the right to disagree with with Derrida, to uh, engage with his thought. And part of earning that right is, is coming to grips with what he's really saying. And it's pretty amazing uh, the work that you've done to show what Derrida really says and what he what he really believes and how different that is from just the sketch you get in an intro to philosophy class or from reading a critique, uh, you know, a short little critique. So I thought we could go through some of uh, his language and you could help us help us out with this. Um, maybe starting with uh, just the word deconstruction, because I think that's as Americans, we're like, yeah, he's a deconstructionist. So he doesn't believe that you can. Uh, know what the author intended, which is self-defeating. So we don't need to deal with, with Derrida. Uh, what, what does he mean by, by deconstruction? And actually, I guess that's not even really his word. Um, he does use it, but he, he doesn't like it as a label for everything that he does. Okay. And he, he keeps changing his language over time. You'll find from book to book, he rarely uses the same terms to talk about what he's doing. Hmm. And one reason that he does this, and this is probably a good way into saying what deconstruction is, is that he's he's trying to say that deconstruction isn't a method that you impose on a text from outside. It's not like you've got your Marxist reading and you've got your, I don't know, your feminist reading and you've got your deconstructive reading, you just pull it off the shelf, you yeah. turn the handle, you apply it to the text and there you go. His, his own reconstruction of what he's doing is that deconstruction is already all, always happening in texts and what you need to do is read them carefully and notice. Yeah. And his idea is that our language never communicates perfectly and exhaustively what we're trying to get over, what we're trying to say. Uh, language always pulls itself apart at the seams to, uh, to some extent. He's not saying we can never mean anything and everything's absolutely gibberish. You know, we're having this conversation. I'm understanding what you're meaning. You're under so th there's an adequacy of, of the communication of meaning, but it's never perfect. Yeah. And if you read a text, and again and again, he's engaging with, with different texts in his work. He's reading very, very closely, sometimes, you know, focusing on a, a particular word or on a particular footnote. He says, if you look at it very closely, you find that language is always pulling itself apart at the seams. It's never quite saying what it tries to say. It's never exhaustively offering you up the meaning um, that, that it's trying to give you. Mm -hmm. And so he would say that, that deconstruction is, is just a word for how things are. Um, uh, he says one famous quote that I've got here, deconstruction is not an operation that supervenes afterwards, he says, from the outside, one fine day. It's always already at work in the work. Hmm. And so he, he'd say, all that I'm doing is reading carefully and showing you what the language is already doing in text. That, that's what deconstruction is. Okay. Um, so so we, we recognize that it's happening when we look at someone's text and we see that... Uh, 
there's ambiguous there's ambiguity or vagueness or something or is that do we recognize it in the text yeah that sort of thing so the it his idea is that meaning is never fully present in mm. a text um and he one of his his big ideas is this this idea of a metaphysics of presence yeah um and what that really means is that we in, in this sort of greek roman western tradition have built for ourselves an idea that if something is for, for something to to be meaningful it must be fully present to my gaze i to my intellectual gaze yeah uh, it, it must fully reveal itself to me exhaustively there must be no shadow side of it nothing left out mm -hmm. uh, and that is truth now of course that's contingent we could have built truth in a different way he's saying but we've got this metaphysics of presence but he's saying it isn't we can't deliver it can't sign the checks that it writes this metaphysics yeah. of presence mm -hmm. because if you just think about the way that that language works he would argue a, a word is never is never a, an atom entire unto itself right. you know words are always refer to other words for their meaning so it's never fully present exhaustively given over to you before your gaze you always need to go outside a particular text or word to bring a context to it to bring a, a definition to a word and you know he's not saying oh therefore let's just burn the whole thing down he's <laughs> just it's the way that language is, you know, you yeah. do, you've got to realize that this metaphysics of presence was just a fantasy. Uh, it's not the way that meaning and language work. It's not the way that truth works. Yeah. Um, and so meaning always refers outside itself. Texts always refer outside themselves. Nothing wrong with that. It's just the way they are. So in a yeah. sense, if you want to recast that in a Christian language, um, and again, I'm, I'm just trying to give you Derrida at this point rather than a critique yeah. of him. Someone, someone who's fully buying into this idea would say, he's, this is just um, uh, uh, trying to, in a sense, break down the idols. The metaphysics of presence is an idol. Uh, it's, it's a false reality. And, and we, need to, we need to break it down in order to see how meaning really works. Yeah. Yeah. Does, um, would, would Derrida think that the metaphysics of presence this this like you know what he calls idolatry what does he think it's like a a, a naive kind of uh view like a naive realism or something like that that it's just people we act like we we have the meaning fully but look at it more closely it's it's a naive view it, does he say language like that or is that too is that too harsh yeah well I, I think it's actually probably not harsh enough okay so i think he would say that it's naive but i think he would also say that it's incredibly dangerous so what, what it ends up with is people who walk around thinking they they completely understand the way things are. And in, in some cases, that's pretty innocuous. You know, there's many instances in a given day where that's not a big deal. And, you know, no one dies because I think yeah, right. that, that truth completely reveals itself to me. But I think, you know, he would say that there are some instances where that, where that gets really dangerous. So, for example, if you think about it in, in identity terms and you think about the way in which we can stumble into the idea that certain uses of language completely reveal situations to us. And, and I guess one of the real hot button ways in, in which this works in society is with labels like Jew or black or, you know, whatever, Muslim. Yeah. Um, and, and if I go around thinking because I know that particular thing about a person, I, I know everything that there is to know. Yeah. Um, you know, and obviously that's a facile example and it, it sure. works more com in, more complexly than that, but that's the principle. So I stick labels on things. I think I know everything I need to know about them. And I, I shut down my critical faculties. I shut down my questioning. Um, and in some cases that's fine. You know, we can't go around questioning absolutely everything every day. We'd never get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. But in some cases that's really, really dangerous. And it yeah. can quite literally lead to people dying. Yeah. So, so he would say, the, the, the metaphysics of presence, yeah, sure, it's naive, but it's also violent. It's also dangerous. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, his violence talk is really interesting. Um, I don't want to, well, um, maybe we can go right there because it doesn't, the order doesn't matter. But um, he talks about uh, iterability, and I try, I'm trying to translate that into, I think maybe you did this too in the book, but trying to put, uh, I got hooks for hanging stuff and in his his idea of iterability seems to me like a like a universal um like a like a platonic form or something like uh it's if it's multiply uh 
instantiable or exemplified, then it's like what Derrida's talking about with being iterable. Um, can, can it, well, before I ask the question, I guess, and he, in my head, he asks, uh, he says, look, this iterability to say that something's repeatable or to categorize all dogs under the category dog does violence. This is like, like violence of classification. Um, I'm having a hard time like grasping it, but does, does that sound like somewhere close? Yeah, it does. So again, the, the example of, of dogs, I think is, is quite a nice one because it's in the middle ground. It's not completely innocuous, but it, it's not sort of politically charged sure. as much as other examples. So we, we get by in life by putting things in boxes, in, in classificatory boxes. And again, He's not saying stop doing that because you couldn't communicate anything. Right. You know, we've got to have words that, that count for different things. That's the way we manage to navigate life and make sense of the world and not become overwhelmed by everything. But he's also saying that if you, if you put everything in these boxes and then think that by so doing, you've, you've exhausted, you know, the, what there is to say, about a particular thing, then then that is tipping over into violence. Yeah. And so, you know, we have all these things out there in the world. They're big, small, hairy, not hairy, <laughs> you know, aggressive, nice and tame. And we we put them all in the box dock. Um, and you know, that's that's what we do. That's fine. That's okay. But we also need to recognize um that, well, first of all, that's somewhat contingent. Uh, we could have we could have decided to chop up the world in different ways. Yeah, you know it's not necessary to have the word dog. And there, there's a lovely example of um, to to get your your head around this because that sounds strange on on first blush. Yeah. Like, but they're dogs. Like, <laughs> what else yeah. are you going to call them? Are you going to go think with the, about, the the rivers? The, yeah, gonna bring up, I, think about I love this. And streams. Um, so two people are out walking, uh, an, an English uh, and a French woman. And they, they come across a beautiful um, uh, river and the English uh, lady sort of gesticulates towards it and, and exclaims to her friend, what a beautiful river that is. And uh, the French friend uh, who um, happens to be speaking French in this conversation, which says, uh, oui, c'est un très beau fleuve. Uh, and then they, they both saunter on. Um, and it, if you pull that little exchange apart, what you find out is that they've said different things. So mm -hmm. the the, the English lady has divided the world up into big um, sort of wide expanses of flowing water and narrow expanses of flowing water. You know, a, a river is bigger than a stream, is bigger than a rivulet, is bigger than a trickle. That's what English does. It looks out into the world and it says, OK, let's have one word for big flowing water. Let's have another word for medium sized flowing water and let's have another word for tiny flowing water. And that's fine. It, it serves as well in the English language. But the French lady has has chopped up reality in a very different way. So uh, fleuve and the, the rivière are not uh, sort of differentiated in terms of how big they are. They're differenti differentiated in terms of whether they flow into the sea or not. Yeah. Uh, and that's fine. Again, you can get by chopping up reality that way. It's not a problem. But you do need to recognize uh, that the two different languages have diced and sliced the raw material of reality in different ways. Yeah. So, so French has no word for river or stream in, in, in this uh, uh, way. Um, and, you know, we, again, we don't need to throw up our hands in horror and say that language is meaningless and everything's relative, yeah. but, but we do need to recognize that there's not one necessary way to chop up this raw material of life in order to make sense of it. Different languages do it differently. You know, there's the, and I don't know whether this is true. There's the, the 50 words for snow in, in Eskimo language. You yeah. Know, I've heard there, that there too. Is, I just pass it on. Like, I, like it's true. Yeah, yeah. Like I don't, I don't know. That's probably wrong. That's probably wrong. <laughs> but there, there are different ways to chop at reality. Yeah. None of them is the right way. They all allow you to get stuff done in the world, but you've got to recognize that it could be done otherwise. And, you know, if you apply that principle to the idea of dog, you know, it's where we go wrong is where we begin to think that the, the category dog is the necessary one. It could not have been any other way than this. Yeah. This is this word is revealing to me some sort of bedrock reality that's before any human meaning making. I think that's where he would want to draw the line and say, 
No, dog is fine. It's a great word. We can do a lot with it. It allows us to, to name some stuff. Um, but when we think that it's the only way to do it, that's where you start getting into uh, problems. Okay. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, another really fascinating uh, dichotomy, which I, I'm nervous to say because I know he didn't like these dichotomies, um, but you have uh, logocentrism and phonocentrism. And I'm familiar with this a little bit because uh, I've listened to a lot of Jordan Peterson. I work with with uh, college, uh, mostly college wrestlers, and a lot of them listen to Jordan Peterson. So Peterson talks about this foul logocentrism. That, um, he says, you know, the, the postmoderns are foul logocentric. They're against the logos, the word. And, uh, you know, whether he's right or not uh, is neither here nor there. But that, that kind of introduced me to logocentrism. And so I was a little bit familiar with that. And then reading your book, I saw there was a, a kind of debate between logocentrism and phonocentrism. And just super fascinating that there's even this kind of debate. Can you can you lay it out for us and then you know give us uh, Derrida's take on this? Yeah, so let's do logocentrism first. Yeah, it's the idea, and again for him, this this is an idol. Um, this is a false idea that we've got about the world. That meaning is completely and fully delivered up to us mm -hmm. in language. Um, and one example that I think might bring this home is, you know, outside barber shops, you get the red and white stripes to, yeah. to indicate that this is a barber shop. Um, and if you if you take those red and white stripes um, and think about it this way, well, actually think about it in in the way that I, I thought about it when this idea first came to me, which is that there was a barber shop on my way to lectures each morning as an undergraduate, Carmelo's uh, on Jesus Lane in Cambridge, and they had these black and white stripes outside them. And then one day, I walked past the shop and there was some construction work going on uh, just next door. And they'd covered the scaffolding, lo and behold, with a black and white stripe tape, so presumably so that students didn't bump into it in the night or something. Um, and just the juxtaposition of these two instances of uh, white and red yeah. uh, stripes next to each other got me thinking um, that when the white and red stripes are outside a barber shop, we 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 know what they mean because of their context. Yeah, you know that that sort of pole outside a shop means that it's a barber's. We we've grown up in a culture where where we we make that link, and if there are white and red stripes on some scaffolding, we know enough about our culture to know that that means hey, watch out, don't bump into this scaffolding. Now you don't see people queuing up for haircuts outside builder sites, right. and you don't see people walking into barber shops with tools. Like we, we can navigate this meaning quite adequately enough. But in order to know what these red and white stripes mean, you, you need a bit of context. Mm -hmm. if, if you just said to someone, you know, in the abstract, what do red and white stripes mean? You'd say, well, I, I don't know yet. I, you need to give me some sort of context. Are they outside a barber shop? Are they on a building site? Yeah. Um, and so the, the meaning of those stripes is not in the stripes themselves. It, it, it reveals itself in the context in which you find them. Yeah. And then it, you can push that a little bit further and say, OK, well, the red and white stripes outside Carmelo's barber shop. Well, surely that just means they're barbers, you know, case closed. Let's stop <laughs> thinking about that. And, and in some cases, you may well be right. But you don't know for certain that you've you've got the right context. So it may be, for example that the, the person who uh, owns the barber shop is, is a, a huge fan of Atletico Madrid, the, the football team who play in red and white. And they might have put the stripes up there as a, as a homage to their team, yeah. um, uh, you know, that happily coincides with the fact that it's a barber shop. And if that's the case, it's quite important to know that in order to be able to explain why they're there. So, so context, David, I would say, is, is open. You're never sure that you've got all the different bits of information you need to make sense of, of a particular sign yeah. in a particular context. And he would also say that there's no guarantee that things will go on meaning in the future, what they mean now. So, for example, if you think about all those people who were born on the 11th of September, yeah. suddenly in, in 2001, that the meaning of that day for everybody including those people suddenly changes and you've got to you've got to now grapple with this new dominant meaning to that date you know previously it used to be your birthday and that that's pretty much it there might have been a few anniversaries here but after 2001 suddenly the context of that meaning changes and yeah. you've got to deal with that 
And so he's saying that the context is you're never sure you've got all of it that you need to, to be completely sure of a, a meaning in a particular uh, instance. And it can always change yeah. in the future. Yeah, I, I um, was just reminded, I almost, uh, every now and then you have to take a, a science test for your driver's license. Like, I, I don't know the years, eight years, something like that. You got to go over the written exam. And the last time I did mine, I almost failed it because uh, they had all the signs without the, the words on them. And I had no context for it. And the guy's like, dude, you almost bombed this. Like, you were really close to failing. Uh, this is scary. You need to, like, bone up on this. And I was like, look. Are I, you sure I, you I, want to be sharing this with everybody? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I have my license now. I'm good. But but I was just like, look, there's no context. Uh, and there's no words. I, I'm a word guy. When I see stop, you know, I know a stop sign. But some of these other ones, and they're triangles, and they're upside down, and and. It's like, dude, I, I don't go on the color and the shape. I, I need the context for it. And then I can, you know, properly drive. So I thought that was so funny that you know, here's this thing I do all the time. And yet ripped from its context for me, it was really hard to distinguish what's going on with these signs. Yeah. Yeah. Context and devoid really of their, wrong, isn't it? yeah. And devoid of their, their, their words as well was big for me. Yeah. Or arrows and stuff. So, so we got uh logocentrism, uh, and then this was totally new to me, phonocentrism. Yeah, I, I don't think you you introduced this saying that um, logocentrism and phonocentrism were sort of a, a, a dichotomy of it in conflict. I'm not sure that's that's quite how uh, Derrida sees it. Okay. Phonocentrism is um, the idea that we have privileged speech over writing in, in the Western tradition. And he, he takes this back to Plato, and that there's a moment in Hegel he looks at as well. But he says, we've, we've grown up thinking that there's something more immediate about the spoken word yeah. than there is uh, about written language. That if you really want to, to speak to someone immediately, you, you get them face to face and you speak to them. Whereas writing, that's quite distant and the meaning can get lost. Um, and he tries to argue that that's, that's just wrong. There's there's nothing that means that if you're speaking face to face, and he's thinking of Socrates here in that sort of tradition where it's all about dialogue and, and, and face to face, yeah. that suddenly your meaning becomes completely transparent. Hmm. And so phonocentrism is is the idea um, that face to face speaking or, or, or speaking vocally and then listening is somehow uh privileged in terms of meaning over writing and he has this idea called rk writing yeah so he says ev everything is is in a sense originally writing it's it's messy meaning can get lost all the things that we usually ascribe to writing the the messiness and the sloppiness of it he says all, all communications like that everything is originally writing in that sense and the, and speaking is is no different mm. and so um for those who you know maybe started off in like a logocentric type hey we're gonna write um this is fine and then derrida comes along or, or someone if, if we follow a dialectic here and says look you, you things can get confused in a letter words can be ambiguous all this stuff and they say well that's because we need to see it face to face and he goes well you know that's not that's not saving us completely because you can still be misconstrued because you're still using language so even though you think that now you're, you've moved to the the verbal uh communication you're still using words. Is that does that sound right? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. it's all language, and language still relies on context, which you can never completely grasp. And words always refer outside themselves for their meaning. So you haven't got over any of that problem yeah. just because you're now vocalizing rather than writing. Okay. Okay. Um, and now, so I want to come to this is my favorite. This is like this was huge for me. Um, I can't remember where I first heard it. Maybe your conversation with uh, Dr. Anderson. Where you guys were, were talking about each other's books, but there's there's this sentence, this statement that everyone knows if they know Derrida that there's nothing outside the text, and a lot of times you just kind of take it at face value, and uh, look, this is self defeating because obviously there's stuff outside the text, and so Derrida is just a shallow thinker. He's trying to obfuscate on purpose, and you you go into this translation and you say what it really means, and there's there's no outside text. And it just blew my mind and it opened up the the world for me. I really, really appreciate this. So what is what does that mean and why do we get it wrong? I think the first part of that is much easier to answer than the second. I think why <laughs> we get it wrong is a very 
sociologically rich question. Let's just deal with the the first the first yeah. part of it. Um, the there is in there is nothing outside the text is not innocent, and we need to spend a little bit of time on that. Um, he's he's riffing off off Heidegger at this point, um, and Heidegger has something called the the as structure of being. Um, so stuff in the world appears to me as something. So to go back to our dog example from a moment ago, mm -hmm. stuff out there in the world appears to me doggishly, yeah. if you like, yeah. because I've got this concept of dog. Or, you know, stuff appears to me, um, in if I'm a, an English speaker, river-ishly or streamishly, mm -hmm. and if I'm French, fleuvishly or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so things... Things appear in the world as something. They're, they're given to me uh, in, in German, as gibt. Um, yeah. the, the, the world offers itself up to me in, in particular ways. Uh, and the, the French translation for as gibt is il y a, which is the beginning of this sentence, il n'y a pas de hors text. Mm. There, is, um, there is no outside text. And so it's the idea of not, not bare existence, but the way that, that I perceive the world. There is nothing given to me. Okay, that's that's the sense of that there is, um, and <clears throat> the or text again that the English translation really mangles this, and yeah. it's it, it's hard to know how you do it well in English, but the translation we've got sure doesn't help us understand it. Yeah. The French is il n'y a pas de or text, and or text is a noun. Okay, there is no or text, and an or text is like a frontispiece in a book. Yeah. It's the a, a piece outside the main text. It's not part of. It's not a numbered page, but it gives you an insight into what is in the text. So usually in the frontispiece, you know, you might have a picture of the the main event in the text or the climactic event or some indicative moment in a novel. Yeah. So is, it, is, it, is it this part right here? Is this? No. It's so in old books you've got sometimes a, a, a picture before the text that a plate. Um, okay. With with a, a a moment from the text in it. Okay. Uh, so it's it's not a numbered page, but it's it's a, something significant. It's drawing out some significance from the text. I, I'm sorry, I haven't got a book here uh, with a frontispiece in. But if if you think sort of old style, um, uh, sort of leather bound books, often yeah. in, in novels you'll get you know the um, something from from Jane Eyre. Uh, you okay. know, you get a significant moment as yeah. as a plate. Uh, and that the significance of this for Derrida is that it's not part of the text, so it stands outside, so it has some authority over the text, but it comes bound together with the text. So if yeah. you like, almost it's an interpretative key yeah. that comes with the text um, yeah. and that, that has authority because it's not part of the text. Uh, and he would say, and he does say in in Yapadar text, that we don't have one of those for life. You know, we can't go outside the page numbers uh, and get some sort of steer on what this is all about and what's important and what to look for. Um, and in terms of language, there's no word that's outside the dictionary, if you like, that itself has no definition that you need to go outside itself for, on which you can hang all the other words. Yeah. Uh, there's no anchor point um, for language or for meaning outside our, our experience. And of course, he's, he's speaking as someone who, who doesn't um, believe in God at this point. Yeah. Christians would want to say, well, hold on, where does God fit into that picture? But if, if, you, if you bracket God for the moment, um, it, it would seem that, that this is a reasonable observation about the world. We can't get outside ourselves to get some sort of angle on what this all means, because there's no way of, of, of getting outside what you might want to call our lived textuality. You know, yeah. what, what, whatever, whatever we do is, is, is part of our life. We can't bootstrap ourselves out of existence in order to sort of peer up over the edge of the universe and say, oh, OK, I get it now. This is what's happening. Yeah. We, we, we can't get outside ourselves and we I, can't get outside this, this deferral of meaning. And I think yeah. that's sorry just to, to finish off. Yeah, please. So that, that's the the sort of the, the postage stamp version of Il n'y a pas de hors text. OK, I'm, so I love this explanation so much and it. it uh... It reminded me of um, The View from Nowhere by Thomas Nagel, where he's he's making a similar point, and he's saying, look, it's a, kind of naive of some of these moderns who think that we have this objective perspective that that uh, 
elides or excludes the first person perspective because they're so worried about subjectivism or something that they, you know, get rid of the first person perspective as if we have this view from nowhere, this God's eye view. And, uh, and I, I like it. I think there's, there's some resonance there that we, we, we tend to elevate ourselves to this point where we think that we see everything and, and fully. And it's like, we, we don't, we're, we're contextually situated and, yeah, and for Derrida, who who doesn't believe in a, a god, it's like, yeah, that would that would make complete sense. Yeah, absolutely. And the Merrill Vestfall, who's a, a reader of Derrida, puts it in a very similar way. He he would say, he would gloss this idea by saying, look, Derrida is just pointing out that we're not God. Yeah. And that's quite helpful as a realization. Right. right. Uh, to 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 come to that sense. And and again, I think Derrida, certainly that the later Derrida would would push this into ethical and political territory and say, look, the moment you think that you do have some sort of bulletproof, objective understanding of how things really are, he would say that opens the door wide to, to totalitarianism and violence. You know, people going around thinking like they're the uh, the um, the last word on what, what something means or, or how we should go about organizing society. You know, when you start believing that, David would say, that's when things start getting violent. So, mm. so he would see some some quite significant ethical and political stakes to this realization as well. Yeah, that is really interesting. Um, to just to follow back up on the, on the Derrida, there is is he um, is he using this in uh, distinction to um, to Heidegger? Is is Derrida saying like Heidegger was wrong, or is he appropriating that kind of like Lebensweg? Uh, manifest image and saying that's that's all that there is he he certainly doesn't agree with heidegger all the way down the line sure. although he 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 reads him very closely and takes a lot from him so i think he where he where he gets off the heideggerian bus is um this idea of, of the differing and deferral of meaning difference yeah uh, he would say that heidegger doesn't realize um how meaning uh, is um sort of never present in, in, in quite subtle ways, but he's taking a lot from Heidegger as well at okay. the time. It's, it's a, a sympathetic reading, but there is a point where Derrida says, no, I think we need to, we need to say more. Okay. Um, and I, I did have a hard time um, with the differ. I'm going to say, I would say difference with the, the uh, accent there. Um, is difference the same thing as, as Derrida's arch or arc, arch, arch, arch writing? Is that the, is that a, is that synonymous? They're certainly related to each other. So uh, RK writing is is making the point that there isn't some pristine condition of language before it gets messed up. Okay. So there isn't some beautiful 100% um, pure spoken communication before writing comes and, and stuffs things around. And he's, he's riffing off an old um, uh, Egyptian myth of, of writing as a sort of corruption at that point. He says that that's not how it works. Okay. Uh, dif difference is closer to the idea of deconstruction in the sense that it difference describes for Derrida how things exist. Um, so if the metaphysics of presence things that thinks that things exist by being completely present to us, that's what it means for things to be. Mm. Uh, he would say, no, that's not quite right. Uh, things exist always in the mode of being deferred and different from themselves and think again about words in the dictionary you need a bit of context you need a definition to know what you're dealing with and those things aren't found in the word themselves they're found outside right. so he'd say it's the condition of all existence things exist differently hmm. rather than presently okay um now does this does this feed into like the holy other that I don't understand the holy other. I don't think maybe, but in in my head, I think holy other is like a a uniqueness type condition that ever we may be similar, but we're like wholly unique. Completely, but I don't know. yeah, yeah. No, you you bang on. This this brings us back to to our dogs from earlier. Okay. So we've got this category of dog, and we put all these different things in the world in it, and that's fine, and it does a great job for us, and we're we're happy with it, but. At the moment that we start thinking that we've sort of said the deepest thing that is possible to say about these things by putting them in this box, we're skirting over all the wonderful differences, yeah. you know, between uh, one dog and the next. Um, and again, you know, this is not 
sort of a always a crisis moment. You know, you've got to put all forks in the fork box and all spoons yeah. in the spoon box because right. otherwise, you, you know, you can't set the table. So it, he's not saying that we should stop doing this, but he's saying that that there's an inherent danger and an inherent violence to doing this. And it, it's, it's clearer in some contexts to see it than in others. And again, some of these identity markers are perhaps the, the clearest instances in which we can see this. So if, if I say to someone, oh, I met um, I met a black man today. Yeah, you, know, you, you can't just say that sort of innocently and not freight in a number of different assumptions and cultural resonances. Mm. Like, why would you pick that out to, to, to qualify this person you met rather than something else. Like, why are you, why are you sticking that label on? Yeah. You know, are you, are you wanting to suggest something political here? And, and so he's saying that these, these boxes we put people and things in always do violence to, to what he calls the singularity, the individuality of a person. Um, so once, once you, you've put a label like that on, you, you've got to do some work to get behind it to see the individual because, you know, we, we have these senses of what these categories mean and different senses, different people have different senses of what these categories mean. Um, and so he would say all language does violence to, to the singularity of things. You know, one yeah. dog is not just the same as another dog. Um, and, you know, there are certain political contexts in which that, that sort of labeling, you, you can see how it's dangerous more readily than in other contexts. Okay. Um, but but there's a flip side to that as well. So you you could just hear that part of it and say, oh my goodness, language is so violent. Let's stop speaking. Right. And he would say, well, well, that's violence as well. You know, because there are needs that are presented to me. I need to communicate. I, I um, you know, if if I just stop speaking, that does a violence to people who would you know demand things of me. So so if someone comes up to me and says, can I have a glass of water? You say, oh, well, you know, I don't know what you mean by water. And is this a joke? <laughs> is this a psychology experiment? I better not do anything because I don't want to assume what you want. That's violent. Like they're yeah. thirsty. They, they need help. But in responding to them, you can never be 100 percent sure that you've understood the context and that you're you're paying attention to the singularity of this case, that you're not just saying, oh, yes, this is another case of, you know, that box that I put things into. Let me deal with it in this procedural way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so what do you do? Well, you can't, you can't just sit back and say, can't be sure what you mean. Sorry. Cause that's really violent. Right. Uh, nor should you just sort of saunter blithely on and say, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Here we go. You're a case of this. You follow this procedure. Um, and, and therefore th there's always an, an agonizing, there should be an agonizing for Derrida. We should never be completely settled in our sense that we've understood a person or a situation or a thing. You know, I've got A, B, and C category for this person. I need to stop yeah. worrying about who they are as an individual because I now know. Right. Um, he's saying there should always be a sense that, hey, perhaps I'm perhaps there's more to this. Perhaps I don't know enough to be able to to do justice to this person, to this situation. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's this sense of, of singularity that no, no amount of language, you know. A volume upon volume upon volume can never capture everything exhaustively about an individual, about a singular being, um, because you you can't you can't just pile categories up and then get to the end. There's always right. more to say. Right. Um, okay. I I really I'm. This is so fascinating to me. Does do you know if Derrida had any room for like for natures and and essences like? Is there a is there a nature of a dog, even though it's multiply, you know, in, instantiable? And there's this dog. Do do dogs still share a, na a nature, or is it like a we're forced into these categories because we don't want to do the violence of not feeding this dog because we don't know whether it's a dog? But it's kind of a, a useful fiction that we categorize. Um, he's he's not happy with the language of essences. Okay. So so dog is a sign. Uh, yeah. It's a concept. Um. Uh, that we use in order to be able to navigate the world. And it does a lot of good work for us. It helps us not to be overwhelmed by the, the flux of reality, but to be able to, you know, it's, it's part of the way we, we put things in categories that allow us to, to do stuff in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you're, you're looking at this from a, a, a Christian point of view, you might want to bring this into dialogue with 
um, you know, sort of the creation mandate, naming the animals. Right, there, right. There's, there's a goodness to, to naming. It, it allows us to to get by in the world and, and to have dominion and so forth. And that's not Derrida's language, of course. That, that's right. coming at it from a, uh, from a biblical point of view. Um, but we've also got to recognize that, you know, as, as we were saying before, that we shouldn't think that this is delivering up to us perfectly packaged uh, ultimate reality as it is unmediated, yeah. you know, because of the, the fleur of the air example, you, you, you can chop stuff up differently. Yeah. You know, the category of dog is not forced upon us. Um, you know, and we can choose to say, let's categorize animals in terms of breedability and genetics. Mm. And that, that's going to give us something like dog. We, we could have chosen to do it differently. We could have chosen to have all brown animals as a category and all gray animals as a different category. Um, that would have allowed us to get different stuff done in the world. Um, and so, but not, none of those ways is the only way possible yeah. to, to chop up reality into categories. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm glad you brought up signifier and signified. Um, does so I, I believe he gets that from Saussure. Uh, is, is that is that right? Okay, that's right. Ferdinand de Saussure, yeah. And and does he take those? Is, does he take sign and signifier on from him and and um, you know, like whole whole cloth or or does he have his own take on those that that differs from Saussure? Yeah. Well, he will say that what, what Saussure doesn't understand or, or realize, or at least articulate about signs, is, is their differential nature. Mm. So Saussure has this idea that a sign is made up of, of two things, that the sound image, like the, the, the vibrating um, sound waves that come out of my mouth, yeah. uh, which is the signifier, and the concept, the idea of something, uh, which is the signified. And we tie these two together. So, you know, the, the vibrating sound wa waves, dog, we tie to the signifier, dog. Uh, and what uh, Saussure does realize, and David um, accepts this, is that none of these meanings um, are entire to themselves. They, you, 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 you rely on the whole language in order to get a meaning for a particular idea. And yeah. there are a couple of examples that, that really help to bring this home. So if you think, for example, about a train, uh, how do you know that what the 350 from Paddington is? Because after all, it doesn't always arrive at, at 350. Well, it's it's the, the train that is after the 250 <laughs> and before the 450. Now, it yeah. may actually arrive after 450, but it's still after the one before and before the one after. So yeah. it's its place in the system that gives it its identity. Mm. You, you know, you don't say, oh, it's arrived at 351, therefore it's not the 350 train. No, no, it's still it's still that same train. And it, it gets its name and its identity from where it is in the system of the timetable. Yeah. Or if you think about a chess game as another one of, of Socio's examples, um, if I lose one of the bishops in a chess game, I can choose pretty much any household item that's the right size in order to substitute for it. I, I right. can take a pen or a little counter or anything. I can say, look, let's just play the game. That's the bishop. And again, the identity comes from the game that you're playing, not from the little counter. Like You don't have yeah. to make it look like a bishop piece that's in so order true. for it to, to be the yeah. bishop. Yeah. And so so, so Sue is saying words get their meaning from contexts. Uh, a word doesn't deliver up to you whole and in an atomized sort of way a particular meaning, mm -hmm. that, that there's a web of meanings in language uh, and the words get their meaning, if you like, from, from the, the words close to them. You know, the, again, it's how you chop language up, uh, to chop the world up into language that gives you meaning. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Derrida takes that on board from Socio, okay. um, that, that meaning is, is not atomized, but it's all, it always refers outside itself. Yeah. Well, this is so fascinating because I've, I've, uh, I've been doing a lot of work on Donald Davidson and, and he's a, you know, if anyone's a, a, an analytic philosopher, you know, it's him. And he's got some of the same paradigms going on of, he, he calls it holism of the mental. And he says, you can't have a singular thought, um, because you need all these other thoughts about that thought. So you can't think that the dog can't think the cat went up the oak tree because it doesn't seem like dogs can have propositional thoughts because they'd have to have all the thoughts about cats and this particular cat and oak trees and being. And, and once you go back far enough, you say like, maybe it made sense to think the dog 
had this singular thought, but it doesn't really, it's, it's, you know, not very plausible that the dog has this huge interconnected web, which you'd need. And then he also, you know, the sign and signified Davidson talks about how, you know, we, we acquire concepts through language speakers in this triangulation. And so it's just, it's really fascinating to, to see that people are talking on both sides of the, of the ocean there uh, about the same kind of things. And the sign and signified is, is really fascinating for me. I, I wonder, um, maybe Susser and, and Derrida, um, maybe they disagreed on this, but do, do we ever get to the thing in itself? Do, do, does Derrida think that, or is it just our concepts that were, or the, the, the signified, is that as far as we get? Um, if, if we meaning we get in the sense of, of the Heideggerian as geeped, so what, what is given to us in the world, mm -hmm. then, then we just get to our concept. Okay. Um, but if so, you, if if I look at something, so I'm looking at something on my desk in front of me at the moment, and it, mm -hmm. it's a mug. What do I see? Well, I, I see a mug, but that's a concept. You see. So I, I don't mm -hmm. want to. Okay, I can imagine myself being heard at the moment to say that there are only concepts in the world, not material reality. So that there is, there's a bunch of stuff there, but I recognize it as a mug. It is to me a mug because yeah. I have that concept. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see what I mean? So it, yeah. it depends what you mean by get to. I pick it up. Here it is. Okay. I pick something up. That's not a, that's not a concept in the sense of, you know, there, there is a material reality going on. Yeah. But right. the way that I've chopped that bit of material reality up to make sense of it for me is it appears to me muggishly. Yeah. It behaved muggishly right. to me. It's a mug. Yeah. Now, can I get behind this idea of mug, you know, to um to the stuff? Well, you know, I can I can hit it. It's you know, to I'm, use I'm checking Johnson. out my mug too. Yeah, that's the fine. Well, well, hey. Yeah, as as we're <laughs> doing it. Yeah. Um so I don't I don't want to to sell David a shot by saying that he's saying that there's nothing out there. Okay. But, but what there is out there appears to us necessarily in terms of our concepts. That's just the way we we apprehend the world. Yeah. Um, does, does, does that help? It, it, it helps a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, it does. I I want to uh, I want to lay out Derrida before we can, you know, kind of critique and stuff. So I'm I'm trying to hold back here. Um, well, well, I want to get, I want to come back to the concept stuff and maybe see like what, what, what you might think Van Til might say, uh, in regards to that. But I want to get to, um, uh, relativism and incommensurability. And maybe this might be a good, a good time because a lot of people listening have heard that he's a postmodern, Derrida is a postmodern or it's a relativist or this and that. And, um, I, and I would have said that before reading your book, but you talk about this incommensurability. And by the time it, I got to that part in the book. I was like, oh yeah, of course, of course he's right because you did such a great job of laying him out. But um, maybe just what, what is relativism and, and why is Derrida not a relativist? Yeah. Um, I think it's a, a really helpful question for, for getting a handle on what David is doing. Cause you're right. He is very often characterized as a relativist. And I think it's very hard to understand what he's doing. If, if that's the category that we bring to him. So, so let's start off with the example of, of grandmothers, perhaps. Um, Parker, if I were to ask you how much is your grandmother worth, hmm. I, I, I'd hope that I wouldn't get a straight answer from you in terms of dollars. Right. Um, that, that sort of question is objectionable. My grandmother is not sort of reducible to an equivalence of, of, of money value. That's yeah. not how people are. She's not worth more than your grandmother. She's not worth less than your grandmother. I refuse to compare your grandmother to mine in terms of dollars yeah. is the sort of response that, that I think most people would give. Um, and what we've done at that point is we've refused to speak relatively about our two grandmothers. Uh, so I'm not saying that mine is worth more than yours. I'm not saying that mine is worth less than yours. I'm saying it's objectionable to compare them <laughs> on, on that basis. Um, and that's, sort of a, a, a vignette of what Derrida is doing with, with singular things in general. So he's saying relativism always finds some common measure between things. We, we compare things 
according to something that they have in common. But again, this risks reducing that the singularity and the uniqueness of those things. Um, and so he, he would stress rather than things being relative that the idea that things are incommensurable because uh, they can't be measured against each other. Yeah. Because at the moment that we choose a particular measure, we're saying this thing is what is important about that person. And, and let's just stick with grandmothers for a moment, perhaps. Um, if we say, well, my, my grandmother can um, still uh, work, so, so she's productive in society. Um, mm -hmm. she, she can produce wealth. Um, and sadly, um, someone else's can't. Then you could say, but that, that's a legitimate thing to say. You've, you've, you know, that's true. But in choosing that particular measure, you've made a judgment about what's important about those people. And there's a whole ideology behind that of the, the worth of someone being in their ability to produce value for society, which has all sorts of implications for, for older people. Yeah. Um, and so choosing the measure is never innocent. Hmm. Uh, you're always making an assumption about what's important when you measure something against each other. And that's what relativism does. Things are relative to each other in that they, they measure one thing against another on a particular measure yeah. that's been chosen. That wasn't the only measure you could have chosen, but that's been chosen for reasons that usually are not talked about. So he would say, if we don't want to do violence to things, if we don't want to sort of pluck out of the air some measure that makes a judgment about what's important about things, what we should realize is that things are incommensurable with each other. There's no measure that I can choose to adequately compare your grandmother to mine. So I shouldn't try to find the ideal measure that yeah. does justice to, to both of them. I should recognize that they're they're singular, they're individual. Can't, they can't be brought into some economy with each other. And and he he would do that not just about grandmas, he'd do that about everything. Yeah. Um, although again, you know, the political and ethical stakes are much clearer with some examples than they would be with others. So he would say trying to compare anything to anything else is always reductive. It's like trying to compare that mug in front of me. Yeah, to, to the color blue as an abstract concept. Well, <laughs> where, where do you start? You know, it is, is blue better than the mug? Is it wiser than the mug? There, there's no measure you can use to compare an abstract concept to, to an individual thing. And, and he would say, it's like that with everything. So mm -hmm. let's, let's not think that we can adequately account for things by making them relative to each other. There's always a violence done to the thing. And yeah. so he's resisting this pull towards relativism. Mm. And, and you know, there are obviously stakes for this in terms of capitalism and so forth and the rejection of everything to, to monetary value. And he, he goes into that in some of his texts. Um, but, but the main principle is that as soon as you compare two things to each other, you're reducing their singularity. Uh, so let's hold on to this precious truth that, that they're incommensurable. Yeah. with each other you know i don't i don't want to economize my grandmother in any way she yeah. is who she is don't need to measure her against anything else uh, to be able to uh, to to enjoy that yeah yeah I, I really like this when it comes to like living living beings I, I wonder um if i had two copies of of your book here and uh i was in the store and one has just a mangled up you know fold in the in the cover I, I probably wouldn't buy that one. I'd probably buy the other the other copy. Um, do you is this a is this like not an appropriate example or is, is there too much disanalogy because it's not a living thing? It actually is a commodity or what do you make of that? Well, in in principle, it's it's the same thing. The two books are not the same. You know, yeah. there are differences. Uh, different atoms. You know, different trees cut down to make those particular books that came from different forests. Um, you know, the, and so forth. But but again, there are some examples where the stakes of this are much more acute and immediate than others. Mm. And so, you know, Derrida wouldn't say calling those books the same is is just as violent as saying your grandmother is worth more than mine. Okay. Um, you know, there, there, there are degrees, but but the, the principle holds for everything. No two things are exactly the same as each other. And as soon as we measure them against each other, we're doing some violence to them. Yeah. But Again, there, there's there's always what David calls a double bind. There's always a flip side to that, which is you can't get yourself off the hook by saying, okay, I'm never going to compare anything to anything else. I'm never going to bring things into an economy of meaning with each other yeah. because you 
you know, you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning and you do violence to everyone to whom you have a responsibility. You never get anything done in the world. Yeah. So so you, you've got to you've got to make these judgments. And, and I suppose in terms of the, the grandmother example, the rubber really hits the road when you get to the allocation of healthcare resources. Yeah. You know, it's it's all there, fine. Yeah. yeah, it's all fine and dandy to think everybody's incommensurable, everybody has an absolute, you know, sort of right to exist, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we have a finite number of dollars to spend on keeping people healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and we can sort of push those dollars around a bit, but but we don't have an infinite pot and we've got to make some healthcare decisions. You know, are we going to treat this disease or put money into research and development to try and cure that other one? Are we going to sink money into palliative care? You know, what, what are we going to do? And some people are going to die because of those decisions. Whatever your decision you make, some people are going to die. And so you've got to decide. You've got to measure people against each other in some sort of objectionable reductive economy otherwise you don't help anyone yeah but i think what derrida would say again it's the moment that becomes nice and easy for you is is the moment you've you've misunderstood what you're doing and the moment that it becomes dangerous mm. you know the moment that you don't agonize over those healthcare decisions is the moment you've lost singularity yeah. of you so you must decide you in a sense you can't decide there is no completely legitimate bulletproof i know that i've made the right decision way to go mm. but for that you can't for that reason say oh i'm just going to wash my hands of it I, i'm going to make no decision at all because that itself is violent whatever you do is violent huh. wow yeah um and and so but just because everything is violence doesn't mean there's not a, a more appropriate choice because uh prop the if there's two extremes and not acting is violence and sometimes can be very violent in that it could cause death and in other uh the other side there's still violence but somewhere along the scale between the two most extreme violences is an appropriate action uh right like there, there would he think that um to a certain extent but you should never become comfortable with the decision you make it's okay. a little bit like the trolley problem isn't it, it yeah um, right yeah. You, know, you shouldn't think oh well i'm going to save all the people on the train and kill my son and i'm really happy that i've made the right <laughs> decision there you right know, you mourn you mourn the mm -hmm. son my goodness me you know so so you're never you never say well let me calculate the happy medium here and the best allocation of healthcare resources is this look at me haven't i made a wonderful decision i've minimized the violence aren't i good right Th that is to completely understand misunderstand yeah the stakes of the situation. You know, you make your decision, you go to bed that night, you agonize over it, you worry about the people who are not going to survive, you, wor you worry about whether you've made the right decision, you go over it in your head. That's the that's the human way to do it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Not to, not to say, I'm, I'm really satisfied now that I've minimized violence, let's go on to the next decision. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. And I've often thought about that when it comes to, you know, my own sustenance and being alive. And my body is making these cells out of, something that had to die and if i went full you know vegan or vegetarian i'm still gonna have to eat plants um something has to die to give me life and uh say what you will about the movie avatar but i thought they they handled this really nicely in, in one of the scenes uh are you familiar with the the movie dr walken um i to my shame uh how long has it been out now i haven't it's seen it no, no worries no worries no worries um but there there is this one scene where um the like invader um he's in a, a a body that's like the natives his consciousness is transferred into this other and so he's acting like them and they're kind of you know primitive -y, so they don't quite know what's going on but they know he's not one of them and he doesn't know how to navigate the jungle and these big jungle cats start attacking him and this uh like the princess of the tribe comes and saves him and it's, it's basically a ripoff of, of pocahontas or something and um she saves him and he goes, yes, thank you. You know, she, she speared this, this jungle cat type thing. And she goes, this is a sad day. This is terrible. This cat had to die because of your uh, fumbling around. And I thought that is right. Like for, uh, for, for an image bearer, you know, when we're out hunting or, you know, you get a deer or whatever, whatever food you're eating, there is still a sense of like something had to die. There was violence done for me to live. Now, I'm still glad that uh, I get to live, but I'm not, you know, I'm not super thrilled that something had to die, you know. 
and that's i think that's right isn't it you know yeah. death shouldn't be something that that means nothing to us right. you know and um yeah and and there's there's a sense in which you, you can transfer the conversation we've been having on to eating you know yeah. so eating nothing in order that nothing die wouldn't itself right. be a solution that you, means you can just wash your hands of everything because you'd end, you'd end up dying. <laughs> right. Um, you know, so, so you've got to, you've, you've got to do violence to something. And there's, yeah. you know, this doesn't, yeah. So you, you shouldn't be able to get off easily. I think is David's point. They, they shouldn't sit ever so comfortably with you. Um, and there should always be a sense that, okay, if I, have I done this right? Have I missed something? Um, you know, and, and in the case of healthcare resources, could I have done it differently? Should I have done it differently? Mm. Uh, do I need to go back and have a look again? Do I need to take something else into account? Yeah. Um, and it's the moment we lose that reflex and that genuine sense of, um, I'm, I'm not sure that this decision was just, I, I need to, I need to keep thinking. It's the moment we lose that that I would that that he would say I think that that we're opening the door to totalitarianism and and to all sorts of violences yeah. um, that 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 go with thinking that we have some sort of God's eye view and our decisions are bulletproof. Yeah. It's so it, yeah, it's really really fascinating. Um, well, I want to jump into to some more stuff on God here since we're talking about God's eye view and and um, is. Is Derrida rightly called an atheist? Is he is he truly an atheist? Um, there's this wonderful quote of his where he he says, "I I rightly pass for an atheist," mm -hmm. um, and I think there's there's a really important reason that he puts it that way, rather than just saying, "I am an atheist," and and the reason is that to to make the claim. I have an atheist. He he rightly recognizes. I think it's very dogmatic. Uh, it suggests that I know everything that could possibly be known yeah. about ultimate reality to the extent that I can say that without qualification, there's no God. And again, this this is context. Again, I I exhaustively understand the context. Uh, there's nothing that's passed me by. There's nothing I've misunderstood, and I can authoritatively declare to you from my view from nowhere that there's no God. Yeah. Um. And he would say in the same way for him that we can't say that about there being a God. We can't say that about there not being a God. He would say that those two claims are basically the same, differing in the small detail of where, whether you conclude that there is or isn't a God. That the, 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 the nature of those two claims is, is the same. Um, and so although functionally uh, he he is writing, look, some David scholars will go back, back and forth about this, but let's just say functionally he is writing as if there is no God. Okay. Um, he can't categorically proclaim that uh, from the position that he's in because, you know, there's nothing outside the text and he can't lift himself uh, up outside of his own experience and take a peek at the universe uh, from some sort of God's eye view in order to proclaim that. So he, uh, I think it's it's fair to say, and, and there are some Derrida scholars who would grumble at this, but I think it's fair to say um, that that he writes atheistically Mm -hmm. um, but to make the categorical claim that you're an atheist uh, would undermine the the way that that he understands uh, existence. Yeah, I think that's so fascinating. Um, when he's him being consistent there, it's it's like um, this this famous famous uh, example. Maybe it's from from Bertrand Russell about the the king of France being bald. And it's like, well, is, is that a true or false statement? It's like, well, there is no king of France. So if I say true or false, I'm buying into this presupposition that there is a king of France. So I can't answer that. And I think it's a it's a similar thing. Whatever you do with the conclusion there, there's a bunch of weird stuff. But it's a similar case in my mind that if he were to answer that question, he's buying into this, this binary that he's trying to oppose. Yeah, and he's claiming a God's eye view, you know, in order to say... Um, uh, I'm an atheist. There is no God. Yeah. You've you pretty much got to know everything yeah. because, you know, who kn who knows if he's looking out there in a little bit of reality you haven't considered or in a way that you haven't conceived. Right. Yeah. That's so it's so fascinating. And and um, but because of other things that he said in his writing, um, yeah, it's fair to to 
categorize him as you know fitting that title i i think because he, he says there's no transcendental signified and in my head like god is a transcendental signified right um so he yes he says there's no transcendental signified by which he means there's no word outside the dictionary mm. to hang everything else on there's no concept that doesn't refer to other concepts for its meaning yeah um i think rather than saying god is the transcendental signified i'd want to give the bible the opportunity to set its own categories up um, okay so in the same in the same way that we've we've extended to david the, the courtesy of saying okay you you explain yourself to me in your own words you know you you give me logocentrism deconstruction nothing outside the text you set things up as you want in a sense you set your own table for you to eat at derrida yeah i, I think that we need to do the same with the bible and, and and so rather than saying that that god is the transcendental signified i say okay bible you <laughs> you set your own table you you give me your concepts you give me the way that, that you look at the world you set things up how you want and then we'll bring that into conversation with Derrida and try and find ways to get those two to talk to each other. Okay. And so I think they to, to circle back round to this idea, okay, so where does God fit into this idea of transcendental signifier? I think, and this does bring us to Van Til, um, I, I think that the fundamental biblical reality that you'd want to bring to bear on that question is what Van Til and others have called the creator-creature distinction. So for Derrida, everything that exists, exists in one particular way. It, it exists differently, deconstructively. It always, it's, it's never fully present. It's the yeah. metaphysics of presence idea again. Uh, and, and everything that exists, exists in that way. There's one way that things exist. But for the Bible, that's not the case. There are two very different ways in which things exist. There's a way that God exists, and there's a way that everything else exists. Yeah. And God exists uh, eternally um, and um, everything else exists derivatively. Um, uh, things were made by him, rely upon him. He holds them together by his powerful word, uh, says uh, Hebrews. Uh, and so we can't say that the, the universe exists in the same way that God exists. They're, they're two fundamental different modes of existence. Um, and unless you start with that position, I don't think you're ever going to understand the, the 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 really radical difference a biblical view of the world makes to a Davidian view because he 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 doesn't have that tool available to him he he doesn't have that resource like there's one way that things exist for yeah. Derrida but but two ways for the Bible and that that means you're playing a different game right from the beginning uh, and so rather than saying that that God is a transcendental signified which sort of I think buys into Derrida's categories too much I think you mm. want to say um, you know that that God uh, is the creator of the universe and that he exists differently to how the universe exists and take it from there and then tease out the consequences uh, of that. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, that's really helpful. I, I wonder, um, so there's, there is no outside text for Derrida. Um, maybe, maybe I'll be, uh, importing his, his, uh, categories too much here again, but, I wonder is is the Bible like an like an outside text? Is it like the the manual that um, you know kind of stands outside, or or maybe God's rev revelation, or is God God's own interpretation the outside text? What do you what do you make of that? Yeah, it's an absolutely fascinating question, and I I, I do it, it's one that I have had to think about, um, and that I I do address in 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 something that I I've, I've written recently. Look, I think. I think the problem is that you start off with this dichotomy between subjectivity and objectivity. Mm. And you, you have this category of objectivity, which is a pure, unadulterated, perfect knowledge. And you have this category of subjectivity, which is, which is flawed and bounded and biased and blah, blah, blah. Um, and if you ask the question, well, where, where does the Bible fit in that dichotomy, which is a very modern dichotomy, it's a very post-Cartesian dichotomy not everybody everywhere has always thought about things in those two categories yeah i i'm not sure that the bible really fits that hmm. because you've got what, what what have you got as 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 van Til would say at bottom of everything yeah well you've got the triune god which is a who is a personal reality um 
and, and who is spoken of in personal terms. So you think, oh, oh, well, it's subjective then because we're talking about personal reality, personal point of view. Well, yeah. no, because God isn't like us. His perspective, his understanding is not limited in the same way that ours is. Oh, well, we're talking about objectivity then. No, 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 because it's personal. And so I think that the way that that the, the Bible and that Christians view the world bursts apart these two dichotomies of subjective and objective. It, mm -hmm. it if, if you set in a sense, to use a slightly clumsy term, diagonalizes them. Yeah. It takes some of the some of the elements of what we think of as subjective and some of the elements of what we think of as objective and completely rearranges them. So it's it's a, a God's eye view that does have reality delivered to it exhaustively. So it's like both a, part of subjective and part of objective in the way that we've, I think, reductively divided the two up. Hmm. And so um, is is God... What was your original question? Is God outside the text? Is that what we're doing? Is is he, you know, is his perspective the outside text? Okay. Um, well, his his perspective doesn't fit into Derrida's schema. In a sense, Derrida doesn't see the biblical God coming. The way that Derrida sets things up doesn't leave a nice place for the biblical God to fit. Hmm. So the God comes in, if you like, and I don't know what image you want to use. He overturns the, the tables in David's temple. He, he, he <laughs> redecor redecorates and changes the rooms around. He, he, he can't fit. I guess he's the new wine that doesn't fit in David's. Old ah, there we go. That's great. You, you know, you wouldn't, I think he would, he would say to David, uh, if David had said, where do you fit in my system? He would say, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't start from your system. <laughs> yeah. I, I would, I would start from somewhere else. And so the, the biblical idea of a triune, personal deity uh, who is omniscient has no category in Derrida's scheme. Um, and so it, it it might do heuristically to say that God is outside the text, but be, be, before you go too far down that path, you need to start breaking down the categories rather than just assuming Derrida's categories and, say, and saying this is where the God of the Bible fits into them. Yeah. Okay. That's really helpful. I think also of... Um... Uh, a Derrida's decon de is it deconstruction or critique or rejection of um, of onto theology and mm -hmm. um, and how you know Van Til's uh, absolute personality following uh, Bavink and and others um, how those two aren't the same thing I, I wonder uh, what do you make uh, well first what do we call Derrida's um, is it a critique of onto theology? And then like, does that equally apply to uh, absolute, you know, personal theism? Yeah. So I, I, th I think critique is fine. Okay. And he, so onto theology as, as he and, and Heidegger and others understand it is the idea of a concept God. Yeah. So God as being as the highest concept. Um, and, and I think it's, it's an idea um, that, that again, the Bible doesn't snugly fit into. You can't fit the triune personal God into onto theology. So, so there's a sense in which the critique of onto theology is is doing as a favor, in which it's getting rid of an idol, sort of a post-Cartesian God who's like some. Do you guys have polyfiller in the states? If you got a crack in the wall, you you put some oh yeah some sure polyfiller in it to to sort of smooth over the crack is, is that sort of God, you know, there, there's a problem <laughs> in our understanding of knowledge. So let's wheel God onto the stage uh, to guarantee and to underwrite the fact that we know things. Yeah. Um, let's have God as, as the uncaused cause, because that means we can do a lot of great philosophical stuff if we've got an uncaused cause. Um, and that sort of concept, God, the, the God of the philosophers, as it's often been called, uh, I think uh, owes in many cases a lot more to Aristotle than than it does to the God of the Bible. Sure. Um, and so critiquing that is is not is not a bad thing. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't bring down with it the the God of the Bible because he doesn't fit into those philosophical categories. Again, he, you need to rearrange things in order to to make room for him. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and so, you know, the, the triune God is not um, merely thought thinking thought or this prime mover or um, yeah, that, that, 
that makes sense. So maybe we could even appropriate some of some of his critique, uh, yeah, against onto theology. That that's interesting. Um, I think the principle here is that we've got to let the the Bible set its own table. We've got to let the Bible come with its own concepts and the way that they relate to each other and its own way of expressing things, mm -hmm. and then bring that into conversation with either David or onto theology or whatever it is. If if we try and start with something like onto theology and say where does the Bible fit into this? We, we're inevitably going to end up mangling the Bible. Yeah, and and that would be doing violence to it, just like if we were to start somewhere else um, outside of Derrida and try to interpret him instead of seeing what he said for himself in his own writings. Or Yeah. Look, I, I think it's the, it's the courtesy we'd want people to extend to us, isn't it? You mm -hmm. know, if someone comes on, uh, and, and I'm sure this has happened to you, it's happened to me once or twice, and puts you in some sort of, category or says oh you're one of those people right. and you think well thank you very much but you know let's let's engage with what i actually say and yeah. rather than just sort of dealing mm. dealing with me in in that way and you know in the same way that we would be upset if people just pigeonhole us really quickly and then move on uh, you know we should extend that same courtesy both to, to derrida let him set his own table and of course also to the bible yeah yeah yeah. So um, something that's really fascinating is that um, deconstruction, it, according to Derrida, is not the type of um, feminist reading. It's not like before the text. It happens while you're reading and stuff. Um, you mentioned, I think this might have been in a, in a something else that you sent me, um, <clears throat> how you, you, you haven't seen a lot of um, here's a biblical critique in the in the academy. And um, I, I was really. I agree. I, I totally agree with that. I wonder how might how might we go about? So we set these two in conversation, and they disagree. Derrida and the, the Christian worldview, or if you want to take you know a, a Vantillian perspective, they disagree. How do we go about um, critiquing Derrida via you know um, uh, Trinitarian the Christian theism or biblical yeah. theism or, or yeah. Yeah, um, and it's a brilliant question, and it's it's sort of getting us into Christ and culture territory, isn't it? How, yeah. how do you engage with with these ideas? Um, and the the model that I always keep coming back to, and that I just think is absolutely brilliant, is what Paul does with with Greek wisdom in one Corinthians one. Um, you know the, that wonderful passage where he says, you know, God has made foolish the wisdom uh, of the world. Uh, and uh, Greeks look for wisdom, Jews demand science, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block uh, uh, and foolishness, and yet Christ the wisdom of God and the power of God. So if we try and un unpack what Paul's doing there, um, that I think that he's, he's getting us to a place that's beyond Niebuhr's five categories. Hmm. So, so there's, there's very, very clearly in 1 Corinthians 1, a moment of antithesis. Uh, he is saying that, that the wisdom of God and Greek wisdom are not the same thing. Yeah. Um, because the wisdom of God is, is the wisdom of the cross, and that's foolishness to the Greeks. He's absolutely the opposite of what they think wisdom is. Yeah. So you've got, you've got that, if you like, if you want to use Niebuhr's categories there, you've got the Christ against culture moment. That is an antithesis that is never broken down. Mm. Uh, it, it is... It is absolute, but that's not the only thing he says. He uses the same word, Sophia, to talk about both of these things. And actually, he's saying that the, the wisdom of God is true wisdom. You know, yeah. This is the real thing. You know, you Greeks don't have the categories to understand that because you think this is the height of foolishness because a, a, a condemned criminal hanging on the cross is, is the epitome of non-wisdom for you um, but actually this is god's wisdom and this is true wisdom and so there's also a sense in which he's saying if you have eyes to see it and if you have the i don't know the guts to search for it in the place that you'd least expect this is actually dear greeks where you will find wisdom in its fullest truest most wonderful embodiment hmm. so so he's also as, as well as this antithetical moment he's also saying Christ is the fulfillment of what you are searching for. You will never find 
true and full wisdom if you just keep looking for it in the way you are. Yeah. The way you will find it, and I know this sounds foolish to you, but this is the only way you're going to get there, is if you go to the cross, which is the last place you'd ever think of looking for it. But if you do, you will find true wisdom, full wisdom, in a way that you can't even imagine at the moment. And so, so what, what, what is he doing there? Well, he's not simply doing a Christ against culture move. He's not simply doing a Christ transformative culture move. There, there is antithesis um, and there's repentance. There's turning around required of the Greeks. You've got to stop looking for wisdom in the way you're looking. For it. But there's also fulfillment. He's saying that, that God's wisdom can actually bring you what you are falsely and sort of eschewedly looking for. This yeah. is the only place you can find it. And so when when we're thinking about okay, what do we do with Derrida, I, I find that model, that 1 Corinthians 1 model, a, a very helpful one to follow. Um, because it allows you to say there's, there's, there is an antithesis between Derrida and the Bible. They're not saying the same thing in different ways. Right. They're not sort of what is not that one of them is just a little bit further down the road than the other one, but they're following the same road. Um, there, there's, there is an, an absolute antithesis between them. Um, but you also want to say, if that's all you say, I think you sell 1 Corinthians 1 short. You sell mm. a biblical engagement with culture short. Uh, and, and you sell the Bible short because it says, it says more than that. Um, and you also actually sell Derrida short because what, what you can do is say, well, what is, what is Derrida trying to get at? I mean, he's, he's anxious that we don't, reduce this singularity of, of things and of people uh, and simply make them numbers in calculated decisions that allows us to, you know, sort of crank the handle and there you get justice out the other end or right. crank the handle and there you get, you know, healthcare allocation out the other end. He's saying we need to pay, pay attention to this um, singularity. You know, he's also saying l language is, is pretty messy um, and we don't necessarily have the world perfectly delivered to us in our language. Um, and I, I think at that point, um, you'd want to say you you really want to pay attention to, to singularity. You, you really want to honor the, the, the individuality and the uniqueness of things. Um, it, it's, it's hard to do that. It's, it's impossible to do that without recognizing uh, the God who, who made all of these things individually, in whom all things hold together, you know, one right. Corinthians, one, so Colossians, one language for the Christ, for whom all things were created. If you really want to honor singularity, then, and I know this will sound stupid. I know this will sound to you like the last thing you dream of doing because of onto theology, blah, 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 and God being impressive, blah, blah, blah. But uh, if you really want to go through with this, then, then you do actually need to come mm. to the cross. Yeah. And there you will find a, a, a respect for and a love for the individual that fulfills what you're quite rightly grasping towards. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and that's just a very quick sketch just off the top of my head. You, you know, you need to go into a little bit more detail. You need to flesh it out <clears throat> more. But I think what that gets us around, and, and I think that it does it in a biblical way by pressing into the text of the Bible, not by detaching us, us from it is it gets us out of this rather depressing cycle in which we feel we either have to hammer the antithesis as the only thing that we do yeah. or hammer the David is really onto something and this is how he gets fulfilled as the only thing that we do. And you get these sort of two Christian camps and the antithesis people, you know, bash the fulfillment people over the head <laughs> and right. the fulfillment people scoff at the antithesis people. Yep. And and we, we just need to press into 1 Corinthians 1 more and, and see how these are, these moments, without one of them cancelling the other out, are actually articulated together by Paul in a way that's subtler than each of these reductive camps that that tend to sort of grow up around these sort of questions. I I love that, and um, I'm by the grace of God, I, I I think I'm getting a little bit better at it, and I and I'm I want to more and more, and I've learned that from Van Til and uh, from his his concept of borrowed capital. And and some, you know, followers of Antill or Bonson, whoever want to go, you know, borrowed capital, you stole from our worldview, so give it back, and I'm going to hammer you into the ground. And then 
Why aren't they coming to me to hear about Christ and his love afterwards? Instead of affirming, hey, look, I, I, um, I acknowledge that what you're after here is a good thing. But I think it makes sense over here on, on this worldview, according to scripture. Here's why. So if someone's a, um, if, if someone's a, a radical tree hugger or something like, hey, I, I, I think that we're actually called to care for the world. I think it's part of our telos. We were made to be stewards of this earth. And I want to recognize in you, like, that is a very good call um, for, for you to want to do that. I think it makes sense over here. And, and I want to, like, welcome you on over instead of just hammering you into the ground and calling you a tree hugger or whatever, like I just did. <laughs> and and I, I think that's that's helpful. And there's there's another moment in 1 Corinthians 1 that I, I think is is important in building up this jigsaw. It's the God has made foolish the wisdom of the world moment. It's the there's this thing that you want, but there's a pathos to your situation in which you, you can't have it. You yes. can't have the fullness of it in the way that you're searching for it. Right. Um, it, it's, you're never going to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, yours, yours is in a sense, a tragic situation. And of exactly. course this needs to be said with, with, with humility and, you know, you don't sort of swan in there as a deus ex machina saying, listen to me, I've got all the answers. Now, I don't right. think that's what Paul's doing in one Corinthians one either. You know, there's a, uh, there's, there's a, a a, a sympathy that's required, an empathy, and a listening. You know, this is not some sort of clever debating point. Let me let me show you, yeah. you know, in some sort of cocky way uh, where you're wrong. Um, but but it is. You know, there's also a, a proper humble gospel confidence in the sense that you know, everything good that is sought for, however sort of mangled up the way that it's being sought is in the world, will find its fulfillment in ultimately in God and it's only yeah. fulfillment ultimately in him. And that's not something we're proud of. That's something we, you know, our, our jaws drop before that's, that's not us being clever at that right. point. That's God, God being wonderful. Yeah. Um, and to be able to, to dwell in that and enjoy that for ourselves and then invite other people to see that as well, I think isn't, isn't a moment, isn't a gotcha moment. It's not, let me show you how you yeah. know I can, I'm, yeah, it's just come, come with me, have a look at this. This, this, I think, is is amazing. Yeah. Really, Amen. really wonderful. Yeah, it's, it is wonderful. Um, well, so, uh, again, I, I want to, um, I, I don't want to bring, I don't want to mix and match categories too much. Uh, you're, you've, you've, you're teaching me that. But I wonder about the, the logocentrism um, and, and phonocentrism piece. I wonder, just... What do you make of Derrida's case? Um, do you think that it language is as messy as he makes it out to be? Because I, 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 I want to follow that, and I think that that he's he's on to something. But I also see John one, uh, you know, in the beginning was the word. It was the logos, and it's it's a deeper, richer meaning. And and John's doing a lot with that word, and that's really cool. But it is it is the logos, and so God spoke out creation by His word, and so. From from this Christian perspective, I want to say that there is this huge like respect for the word. Part of what it means to be uh, an image bearer of Him, I think, is to create with words like He created, um, and and to you know rule over His ha exercise dominion with words. So I've got these kind of two going on, and I just want to get your take on on how do, how do we match these up? I think the Christian distinctive in answering a question like that is to, um, you could call it, emplot it in the biblical storyline. So mm. there's not one thing that language always is, was, and ever has been. Um, it, its condition changes in the major turning points of, of the biblical story, uh, mm. creation, fall, redemption, consummation. And so we would say that the language we have at the moment um, is, is a language um, uh, our languages, you know, they're post babelian for a start. You know, yeah. we're not still in Genesis two, yeah. uh, where where Adam is is naming the animals, um, and uh, we're not yet in in Revelation twenty one, where we see face to face either. Yeah. So, what what would that predispose you to expect about human languages at this particular point in history? Well, I guess it would ex it would predispose you to expect there to be uh, lots of wonderful communication possible because of Genesis 1 and 2, but it'd expect you, you'd expect language to be reasonably messed up, like mm. everything else as well, as a result of Genesis 3 and Genesis 11. Um, and so communication uh, to be uh, often 
uh, more about power and domination, you know, the libido dominandi to use an, an Augustinian category, which I think is really helpful in this context. Um, and, and pretty much, I think that's not a million miles away from what David is saying. Hmm. You know, language, language is great, gets a bunch of stuff done in the world, um, but it can also um, be quite violent. It's not perfect. It doesn't yield uh, 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 an exhaustive account of reality to us. It can be used uh, for a lot of evil. It's part of, um, you know, the way that we try and dominate each other. And, and I think all of that stuff, you would say, at this particular moment in salvation history, that's where we are with language. Yeah, you know, we're 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 hoping that, and fully expecting that that on some day language is going to be redeemed like the rest of reality. Don't know how precisely. Mm -hmm. Don't know the details, uh, but it's not always going to be like this, and it was not always like this. But but right now, in the moment of salvation history that we're in, that's how it is. But just let me say one more thing because I'm trying to imagine the person listening to this uh, coming up with objections. I think one of the objections will probably be. Um, Oh, so does that mean that we we don't know what the Bible says? Kind of cannot God communicate to us adequately in the Bible? Um, and I think I think the key moment for me grappling with that question came when I realized that that's not my problem; that's God's problem. Hmm. So, if it, and this this is Calvin's accommodation. Yeah, you know, God has accommodated Himself to human language such that we. Um, we have what we need in the Bible, you know, 2 Timothy 3.16, for every good work. We, we, he has communicated himself in a way that means um, that, that I can be saved and that I can be fully equipped for every good work. Now, that's not because I've been very, very clever and I've sort of worked out some sort of theory of language that, that means that I've sort of reached my way up to God. That would be almost like the flesh becoming word. You know, mm. that, that would be me doing the job, climbing the ladder. Okay, I've got God now. I've yeah. got a theory of language that, that can yield God to me. That's absolutely not what's happening. Uh, but God has taken it upon himself to accommodate himself to human language. It's the word that's become flesh. And, and the moment that I say, well, I don't think that can happen, I'm actually saying that I know better than God. Yeah. You know, if... Am I suggesting that, that the God who is capable of creating the universe is incapable of communicating himself in a way that is adequate to salvation? That's a big claim to make. Yeah. If I want to say he can't do that, I better have some very, very good evidence that I know that to be the case because, you know, he's God. He can do stuff. Hmm. And so if, if, he, um, if it's his problem to communicate himself in a way that is adequate to salvation, then... Um, that's great news for me because I don't need to be the one who reaches my way up to God and yeah. finds a language adequate to God. Yeah. And, and also I think, you know, 2 Timothy 3.16 is quite helpful here because it's, it's saying, you know, um, uh, that, that God has, all scripture is God breathed and, and is, and I think the next verb is quite key. You know, it's, it's not all scripture is God breathed and is absolutely transparent as a way of delivering reality. Blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it yeah. doesn't go to that philosophical language. You know, what is the Bible for? It's not for giving us an absolute picture in these modern categories of, you know, what 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 is what is ultimate reality behind language. That's not, if you like, the game it's playing. Yeah. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that men and women of God can be fully equipped for every good work. And it does that job. You know, and so I think when we either when we try and make it our job to reach up to God with language. Um, or when we say that the, the, the bar that the Bible needs to jump is being absolutely transparent in its language and yielding reality to up to me without reserve, we, we in both cases, going beyond what's written. That, that's yeah. not our problem, and that's not what God has done in yeah. the Bible. So we need, we need to realize what, what's going on in the Bible and what's not going on, I think. Yeah. Uh, in order not to get ourselves tied up in lots of knots over them. Yeah. I think that's, that's really fascinating and a, a really good point of, yeah, receiving, receiving the text and letting it speak. And yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, that's God's problem. And yeah. I, God can 
handle his problems like much better than me well, i i think yeah. of icarus or, or, or right? it, it would it would take an immense hubris on my part yeah. to say that he can't but yeah i'd i'd better be able to back that up yeah if i'm well, suggesting that i know better than god whether he can communicate adequately or not right so um what's what's been really helpful for me thinking through this type of stuff is um is actually kevin van hooser's uh he uses this authorial analogy in in his book remythologizing theology and um he he uses it as a way to cash out the creator creature distinction and uh, and the relation so god relates to the world like an author does to his his novel um or his book his theo drama as, as dr van hooser would say and um i really like it because um because of the view from nowhere type language because of the outside text because of all this if i were to say god would have to do things this way this way this way i'm taking the perspective of the author and I'm, I'm putting myself, you know, if there's two levels of reality, like we've talked about from Van Til, I'm saying I'm on the uncreated side. And I know what God must do and what he can and what he can't do. Um, but instead, I'm a situated being within the, the, the narrative. I'm within the story. So let me not project myself out as if I could to the position of the author and make all these, uh, 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 these pronouncements as, as if that were possible. I think that's right. And, and I think... I mean, it depends in what context we're discussing these ideas, but there's also a pastoral side to that, isn't there? That that in the Bible, that doesn't just mean it's a suck it up attitude. You know, right. Job cries out to God, what is going mm. on here? I don't understand. You know, the psalmist cry out again and again. So it doesn't mean you're not God, so shut up. Right. But, but you know, but that's part of a bigger picture. And, and there are biblical examples of people crying out to God, I don't, I don't understand what you're doing. This doesn't make sense. How can this be? And that that's okay. Um, but but I guess that as part of the, the jigsaw puzzle of how we deal with these things, one of the really important points is, and I guess this is where the book of Job lands in many ways, is, yeah, but you're not God. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know. And so all the, all the crying out and agonizing, it's not, um, you know, it's not that how dare you. Right alone it's 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 you know the the psalmist the, the psalmist do that job does that a, a lot of people in the bible do that but but still it remains despite all of that 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 you're not god yeah um and there's a how would you put it there's a freedom in that realization i was gonna say comfort a, yeah a peace in that realization mm -hmm. and and not not a sort of a cheap piece of oh i don't care then Right. Yeah, you know, that's not where the Bible goes with that, but a, a humbling piece mm -hmm. um, that's really important as part of the jigsaw. Yeah, and I and I think it does it does come through that process oftentimes, at least just you know psychologically for me, where it's I'm not God and I wouldn't have done things this way, blah blah blah, and and some humbling going on, and then at the end coming through this process and saying I'm not God, <sighs> like I'm I'm so grateful because if I had to be me and then play the role of God. This is a nightmare, but God can do this. Of course, he, he's out, you know, he's the author. He's the author of creation. He's got it all yeah. worked out already anyways. And uh, yeah. man, praise God that I don't have to play his his role. That's completely right. It, it, I'm watching for the first time, actually. Man, I haven't seen Avatar and I've only seen this for the first time. What <laughs> must people think? I'm, I'm watching for the first time Designated Survivor at the moment mm. Okay, uh, on Netflix. And and it's it's a tiny little picture of the same thing, isn't it? You know, the guy is grumbling at his boss one day. Oh man, I'm going to be fired. This is ridiculous. And then suddenly, the next day, he's catapulted into that position himself, yeah. of being the president. You know, with a thousand and one calls on his um, time at any one moment, huge decisions to make. Do I invade? Do I not invade? And and it's overwhelming. And you know, if that is the case with being elevated a few rungs in a human government, then how much more would it be the case? Uh, were were we and and I, you know this is the end of Job, isn't it? Were we to come face to face yeah. with uh, the God of the universe? Yeah. Wow, man, this is this was uh, this turned out very very pastoral, very encouraging to my soul, man. This is awesome. We we prayed beforehand too, which is like this is an amazing podcast. I love this. Um, th thanks so much for for walking us through, Doctor Walking through uh, your book on, on Derrida, um, Derrida. I, I keep saying it like in a Spanish accent or something, but um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm no good at that, as my audience will know. Um, but you, you've written some other books that are that are fantastic as well. You have one on Foucault. Um, 
one on on creation I, i'm losing the i'm forgetting the, the title yeah thinking through creation that's right it's called right. so it takes genesis one and two and tries to to look at them as tools of cultural critique yeah yeah so fantastic well so hopefully we can get you back on to talk about one or both or um this has been really really fun for me and it's uh been very it, it's been a challenge because i'm i wasn't familiar with a lot of these categories so it was so great talking with you and having you help me think through this out loud which has been awesome um where can people find you if they want to hear more from or read more of your stuff listen to you some more where, where are some places people can find you um, i've i've got a website where i tried to put all the the, the christian resources that i've made it, it's all one word thinking through the bible.com Okay. Um, so people might want to hop onto there, have a look around, uh, see if there's anything that's helpful. Um, my Twitter handle is uh, dr. Dr. Chris Watkin, all one word. So people might find um, that useful as well. Um, yeah. Otherwise, just put my name into Amazon, see what I've written. Yeah. And uh, yeah, look, if anything's useful, then then praise God. That's wonderful. Amen. Amen. Well, awesome. So I'll put a, a link to thinking through the Bible.com and you can find all of Dr. Watkins stuff there. Um, this has been fantastic. I've, I've, I've really been uh, encouraged by this and I wouldn't think that going into a conversation about Jacques Derrida. So uh, this has been a, a, a huge surprise and, and a real blessing. Of course, it wasn't a surprise. Okay, I've, I've, seen had, your work, I've, but, had, yeah. I've had so much fun. It, it's been an absolute joy for me. Thank you for hosting uh, yeah. so wonderfully. Definitely. Well, folks, that's going to have to do it for now. Uh, this has been Parker's Pensies. Uh, please, if you if you like this and you're watching on YouTube, please do give it a like and leave us a comment. Let us know what you think about Derrida, um, some things that, that uh, maybe you didn't understand or that you did get for the first time. Um, you can subscribe and all that good stuff. And again, if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider becoming a Patreon patron. Uh, also, check out Biblios Clothing Company in the link in the description. You get 10% off your whole order. All right, enough hawking and commoditization. Um, this has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.